This is Brian Buchanan from the University of Alberta. You recall the principles of sound generation, including generation of sound waves and the piezoelectric effect and how that sound wave is received by the probe and generates a 2D or B mode image. Back to our sound waves. Ultrasound probes are designed to release a set frequency and wavelength. Generally lower spectrum, like two to four megahertz, or high, like six to 14 megahertz, with middle range in between. We learned high frequency shorter waves are great for superficial resolution, but due to attenuation cannot penetrate deeply. This leads right into probes. Most people do not understand these key properties, but do understand how the probe works. But now you are much more informed. A higher frequency linear probe is great for vascular access, but it can also work for lungs, nerves, and even the chest and abdomen when fluid enables sound wave propagation. It's less commonly used to look in the chest, but actually our colleagues in radiology will often use it to procedurally guide needle insertion to drain pleural effusions and ascites. This is not, this is not commonly done in the critical care environment, but seemingly the radiologists love it. On the right, we see lower frequency probes, the curvy linear and phased array. People often call the phased array the cardiac probe, but it's really a misnomer. The sequential crystal activation of the phased array is great for cardiac activity capture, but it can also be used for lungs, chest, and abdomen. In fact, the phased array probe is just a really smaller curvy linear probe. Further, even the curvy linear probe on the right can be used for vascular and lung, particularly in patients with abundant soft tissue, if you know what I'm saying. We can see how this knowledge helps us really master these different probe types. So which probe and when? Here are some quick notes to consider with each probe type. The linear probe, again, higher frequency probe, 6 to 13 megahertz, it is often listed backwards in the probe as 13.6. Do not be confused by this. Again, it's a high frequency and short wavelength probe and offers great resolution of superficial soft tissue, including vessels, pleura, abscess, and cysts. As demonstrated on this 2D image here, we can see again that really high quality resolution and visualization of soft tissue. Next, the curvilinear probe, you'll notice it's two to five megahertz in the lower frequency range, gets great depth, but less resolution. This is often used in the FAST exam to assess for fluid in the abdomen, chest, deep structures. It's very useful for looking at, looking for abdominal aortic aneurysms. And as mentioned earlier on, it occasionally can be used for central line insertion in the very, very obese. Along the crystalline along curved surface generates a beam that fans outward and has a wide footprint. The result is a field of view wider than the probe's footprint. With a sector-shaped image on the screen, these probes are most often used in abdominal pelvic diagnostic applications, but can be easily applied to the chest. Remember, this probe is set to deep and often needs adjustment if viewing more superficial structures. The phased ray probe is around 1.6 or 2 to 10 megahertz. This, is, this covers a, a full breadth of frequencies and wavelengths. The unique aspect of the phased ray probe is that it electronically sequences activation of the transducer crystal elements. By controlling delays between pulses, beams of various angles and focal distances can be produced for inspection of complex structures and moving structures. The smaller footprint of the phased ray probe allows one to get in between the ribs. As one of my colleagues says, it's like a virtual rib spreader. Slightly convex surface produces a fanning beam, again with a sector-shaped image. This probe is used for echocardiography and thoracic imaging, but can also be applied to abdominal and pelvic equally. And we can see here in this parasol long axis a sector shaped image with a narrow footprint. And really make sure to not drop the transducer as it results in really a loss of elements in this black stripe shown here. First off, I would say you really got to know your machine. I would be really comfortable with the buttons and the location. The last thing you want is to be stuck in a crisis and not know where, where gain or depth or how to freeze the image or how to save the image. So you really want to make sure that this, this thing is like the back of your hand. You know where everything is. This is the Sonosite Edge, and we can see with the corresponding keys here. These tutorials will mainly use the Edge and Export as their display models. We do have other models in circulation, including the Philips CX50 and Vivid Eye. However, we are slowly phasing out these models. My goal is to achieve some degree of homogeneity of machine access for this curriculum in order to ensure a measure of universal approachability to these machines. We can see on the edge screen, depth is displayed on screen right, and the marker is displayed at the top by a blue dot here. Here's an example on the export. We can see here orientation with the screen marker and depth, which is manually adjusted on screen right. What is the ideal depth? 
Well, it really depends on what you're looking at. And you really want to optimize your screen real estate. Looking at the pleura of pneumothorax should be really be 5 to 10 centimeters. The thoracic space for pleural effusions, 14 to 18 centimeters. The cardiac exam, again, really depends, 10 to 15 centimeters. But really, like I said, make sure to use your screen real estate. Here is an adjustment real time. We can see it starts out at 15 centimeters, and the examiner is reducing the depth. And we can see this results in a much better visualization of the pleural line seen here. Probe orientation is also critical, and you must be cognizant of this. In many cases, including vascular access, it is important to, to, to remind new learners how to match up the probe marker with the screen marker. The probe markers are unfortunately proprietary. There may be a knob, it could be a light, but I would encourage you to be familiar with your probe and make sure you know where the marker is at all times. We can see here that the probe marker is placed differently depending on the imaging types. In traditional imaging, including things like lung, abdominal, vascular, the screen marker should be left. In this case, cephalad is usually screen left in the longitudinal position. Of course, in the transverse or axial position, like during vascular access, left is still left and right is still right of the patient. On screen right, we can see it's a touch bit different. Cardiology convention is that the screen marker is placed right. This is, this is really for no a particular reason but of convention, as most textbooks and reference manuals have this placed on screen right. Our machines are automatically set to adjust the screen marker depending on which exam type you choose. We often speak of fields as well in ultrasound, such as the near field and far field, just to describe the gross anatomical position of something you're describing. Next, I'll ask you, what is the difference between these two clips? We can see the image on the screen left is much darker than the wider image on the screen right. This is gain. This is amplification of the returning signal. Gain can help you appreciate structures that are difficult to see. Much like a guitar amplifier, it's important to realize that it also amplifies noise. Therefore, what can happen is you really get an increase in signal, but a result in an increase in noise, making it really difficult to interpret margins and tissue boundaries. So how to get an ideal gain? There really is no such thing as ideal gain, but usually we use structures with fluid inside as a way to, to help us understand this. The fluid should be black, unless the fluid is turbid, which you may see a subtle white hue. So I would adjust the gain to maximize the darkness of anechoic structures. You should be able to cl clearly see the ventricular blood interface to help you describe the endocardium. So it's important to understand that gain is the amplification of the returning signal. And really this, this amplifies signal and noise alike. We can see here that machines have different ways to adjust gain. You can adjust gain in the near field, as seen here, you can adjust it in the far field, or there could be a global gain button, which is just gain in, in all the fields. And then finally, there's an auto gain button. I would encourage you to play with these and experiment a bit to figure out what can op optimize the imaging. But generally speaking, in practical use, I will either alternate between auto gain or the global gain button. We can see here something, this TGC, this is time gain compensation. These, this machine has buttons, but you're probably used to seeing slider bars as well. And this is really gain for depth. So you can adjust the gain separately in the near field or the far field. This is less commonly used, and honestly, in regular applications, I will often just use the global gain button, which affects the entire, which affects both fields, or even just the auto gain button, which affects everything. Other settings to be familiar with, including freeze, imaging types on the right, like MO, Doppler, color, 2D, and how to obtain a video clip, which we'll cover later. Next, dynamic range. This is a button, again, few are, are familiar with, but it really helps to adjust your gray scale. So increasing the dynamic range means more shades of gray. And this, this can make tissue boundaries easier or conversely diff more difficult to see. We can see on the left, we have low dynamic range, so we have less, less of a spectrum of gray, and so it's much easier to see tissue boundaries. On the right, we have a high dynamic range. This is more colors across the gray spectrum and really this makes it more challenging to see these tissue boundaries. So in summary, we talked about the different probe types, key concepts like depth, gain, dynamic range, and near and far field. Again, I'd like to thank you for listening. 
and hope you found this tutorial informative.